I'm delighted to be here, honored to be the first time that we've had a global main event outside of Europe, Australia, and the United States. This is really exciting. Um, I'll, for the people who don't know why I'm reading all the titles on the slides, we have the luxury today of having simultaneous interpretation. So it's easy for the interpreters if I read the captions to the slides, which I don't normally do. Get the idea, money pervades all areas of our society. And I have to say that one of the biggest questions when I try to explain the movement to newcomers or to crowds that are unfamiliar with the Zeitgeist movement is they say, you talk about changing the system. And they think, okay, we change, you just don't like capitalism, is that it? Uh, what's wrong with the markets? What's wrong with money? And I'm gonna try to answer some of that. Hopefully you'll feel comfortable with the answers by the time we finish today. Uh, there's a lot more, even though this is something we all grew up with, we take for second nature uh, as granted. Nevertheless, most of us don't explore what money really means and where it comes from. Okay, the first question, is money automatically bad? Uh, or like most things, let me figure this out, is it just how it's used? One can argue that it's just a thing, but what we're talking about here isn't money as a thing. We're talking about money as an idea, and that's what makes it so powerful. First off, where did money come from? Most of us have probably heard the same stories in school, that money is something that came to replace people going to the market and trading. So let's look at that story. The story begins with barter. Barter is the exchange of goods or services. I have a pineapple and you have a pig, and somehow we figure out how to trade pineapples for pigs. And of course, that sounds ridiculous, and the examples show it, and economists have an explanation. They say that for barter to work, you need an improbable double coincidence of wants. That is, I want what you have, and you want what I have, and hopefully uh, it works out in a quantity that we can agree on, so that I don't have to trade half a pig to you, and then keep half a pig around for some other transaction. So the story goes, we had money as a result of barter. It became more efficient and we call it a medium of exchange. And then we introduced debt because not only did we have trouble with barter, the fact that it was hard to divide up pigs and pineapples and ice cream cones and whatever in the right quantity, but we have trouble that sometimes you want to buy something when your pineapple isn't ripe or your pig isn't ready to butcher. So you extend credit and you have debt, you owe people. But there's a, as we'll see, there's more to that. There's the dark side of debt. <laughs> and uh, actually, the interesting thing is that story I just told you there's no evidence from anthropologists, there's no evidence from archeologists that barter came first. There's no evidence that money came before debt. It appears from our writings and from our history, the first thing that occurred was debt. There are a couple of types of debt, and I wanna go into this because it has significance of how powerful the concept is for us. The first thing is, there was a debt in many religions and many languages Debt is the same word as sin. And so there was a primordial debt, a debt to the universe, a debt to God, a, get, a debt to existence. And in many cultures, many religions, it was expected that you made sacrifices. Whether that was an animal sacrifice, you put time, you prayed, you did something else to try to return your debt to the universe. But 
Ultimately, it was understood that the only way you could return the debt to the universe for the resources you were using that made up your body and your existence was through dying. What's also interesting is because debt, as cultures evolved and we had civilizations and organization, we find that debt and this primordial debt is associated with rulers and governments. And they use this same representation saying they were close to God, they were close and represented society, the community, in order to have contributions of taxes, fees, and so forth. So we actually see that debt came first, people loaned things to each other, and they didn't worry about getting paid back right away, they just wrote it down. And they said, oh, I know you're good for it. Next week, next month, or whatever. Then we had barter. Barter came in because sometimes what you owed was too great, or because indeed you did want to trade some goods and services. Money came later. Uh, let me check this. <laughs> this seems to be going on its own. Uh, after that transition, I want to discuss also, there's something called social currencies. And these are, have been misrepresented in, in our narratives, in our stories. Social currencies are the sorts of things like shells, gifts, gold, whatever, that are used to maintain the humanity and the uh, tolerance of a society. This is people management. This was used, this is the sort of thing where people gave gifts to newcomers to welcome them, to show a sign of peace, and to let them know that they were a member or welcomed into the community. It was also something you gave when someone got married. Um, we have heard stories that women or men were sold that a wife was worth, for example, three lambs. But in reality, that's not the way this was used. Social currencies were used as a sign of respect, and so it maintained the integrity of the culture so that if someone got married, the new family was showing value that they really appreciated this new member of their family coming into their household. And there were systems, there were traditions and rules about how much to give and what people were expected for that. Likewise, this was a way of keeping the peace. This reduced violence in these societies because let's say that I accidentally got into a bar fight with someone's brother and he was injured or killed. Normally that would require vengeance and constant killing and battle back and forth between the families. But because of these social currencies, these traditions allowed one to maintain their dignity and their respect. So perhaps for the killing of a person accidentally, it might have been three cows. And the family, that didn't mean you paid for it, it meant that you were trying to set things right. And the people you gave it to were to understand and accept that effort. And the people who gave it understood that they would be forgiven. And so it maintained uh, the society. We've seen other examples of this and we've also seen historical distortions of these stories. Money requires force, and that's significant because usually the source of force is the state, the government. That's part of its job. When we talk about arrangements, transactions, contracts, we enforce the contract. And so it always implies some sort of violence, either direct or threatened. It also enables dominance. Not only those who command the force, but those who issue the money, uh, those who have more, uh, are able to take advantage of it. It produces hierarchy. Because it allows itself to be, to, uh, be accumulated, it means that people can have various amounts of that. And that's another form of inequality, but this makes for permanent differences in 
the uh, position of people in society. And quite frequently we see money and force associated with each other. Money provides the right to take. I call money control tokens because basically that's what it is. It's an agreement along, if you, if you go along with it, it's an agreement that allows you a certain amount, a mathematical uh, sum of control. Control in various forms, various situations throughout the society. Okay. I go to the bank and check my slavery balance. I, I don't know about you. Gold is the money of kings, silver is the money of gentlemen, barter is the money of peasants, but debt is the money of slaves. Not sure if I'm a slave or a star employee. You're not a slave to a power-hungry, money-grabbing, ego-driven fiction. You're doing your duty as a productive citizen. Right now, I think we'd have to say that money is... Hello? Uh, I would have to say that money is the ultimate universal weapon. Uh, we see how important it is when we see the competition over currencies. Uh, right now, embargoes not allowing you to use a certain currency basically is the most powerful means because it it restricts your access to any number of goods and services. We all know power is relative. I can become more powerful by accumulating more, doing more, somehow acquiring more. Or, often the easier way, is I can find a way to make other people weaker and have less. That's been used throughout history. It continues to be used. One of the most common ways is war. So if I can make the circumstances of others worse, it's the same as if I got richer. And we see that. We see that in the money field, where money, uh, large portions of the global um, supply of money are completely taken off the market. They're out of, the, out of, the, out of play. What is inequality? If power is relative, how does that fit into inequality? I think we could think about that, but I think it's pretty clear. The caption says, all I know is, each time I look, I see less and less poor people as his bag of money increases. Okay, I wish this was, was true. I'm from Sweden. Sweden is known for having the most egalitarian society on the planet. That doesn't mean it's egalitarian. And it's gotten worse. But for those of you who don't know what the terms are, this is a supposed Swedish organizational structure with marketing finance, the chief executive officer, and then a word fika, and that means coffee break, and then cleaning. It's not quite that way, but I wish it were. Well, the other part of the equation when we talk about the current system is markets. Some people talk about markets with money. And we're also going to look at what are markets without money. 
With money, we see commodities, we see goods, and we see people around them, consumers. Everything is commodified, the process of commodification. People, services, raw materials, water. Without money, and the caption shows two people, one says, pleasure doing business with you, and the other says, as always, sister. And the key there is without money, every transaction is individual. They're unique, they're personalized. And it could be a different price, a different exchange, depending upon who's involved. So in summary, the difference I would say is oppositional one-time transactions versus ongoing relationships. Because in, without money, you're planning on having some future interaction that can adjust and accommodate. Commodification means it's a one-time deal. You walk away, you don't care. I look at market success, any market set success, but particularly in the area of finance, as having three different areas, three different categories. The first, the first one, if I can get this to come up. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, the first thing is to manufacture scarcity. Make sure there's a limited supply and that you can control it, hopefully. The next thing you might guess, solidify demand. Make sure people have to use it, that they need it, that the only way you can obtain a house is to get a mortgage, have a large amount of money at one time altogether. You can't yourself pay over time, so you have to go and get a loan. And the third category is the knowledge secrecy ratio. What was shown there, the first diagram, was part of a uh, flowchart indicating how loans are evaluated, how banks look at individuals, they have massive databases, they know everything about you and the people you know, um, and they use these calculations to determine how they want to deal with you. The second part was a summary of about everything you know about your bank. You, can't, you don't know their financial statements, you don't know their investment strategies, you don't know how they calculate or deal with you, and so you have a really big guy with all sorts of information about you against a really little guy who knows very little about the people he's dealing with. What is it with secrecy? Not only is that a part of knowledge, but right now we can think about cryptocurrencies and things too. Well, secrecy has been around a while. 150 years, we had the first corporations, syndicates that came together, and they allowed for individuals to put their money together, but also to disappear in a form of anonymity. It was hard to hold them accountable, as we used to be able to uh, hold kings and lords and others accountable. Now if we look at cryptocurrencies, what do we think about that? Well, the first appeal was that we had the ability to stay anonymous ourselves. But with the biggest players being involved, we may actually look at a situation where we know less than ever about who those trillionaires, trillionaires are that control so much of our world. Sweden has not produced its own cryptocurrency, but they're looking at it and I'll let you know that uh, we are nearly a cashless society. So everything we do, they know. And many places, including supermarkets, will not take our money anymore. We can't buy with cash. Here are some quotes from people that love money. Warren Buffett says, I will tell you the secret to getting rich on Wall Street. You try to be greedy when others are fearful, 
and you try to be fearful when others are greedy. Ronald Reagan says, money can't buy happiness, but it certainly will get you a better class of memories. And finally, John D. Rockefeller. The way to make money is to buy when blood is running in the streets. Happy thoughts. Here's another opinion. Pablo Picasso said, I'd like to live as a poor man with lots of money. I can understand that. But most people I talk to say, I only want enough that I don't need to think about it. Which is interesting. It's so important in our lives. What does that say about money? What sort of relationship is that? If that were your spouse or child, oh, I love my wife, uh, I just don't want to be around her. Or uh, my, my child is great, but I don't want to have anything to do with it. Or my job is, is wonderful, I don't have a problem with my job, as long as I don't have to go there. So, <laughs> who am I to put down money? Okay, you heard a bit about my background. I did not believe in money, working for money. But people didn't believe after I went through my education that I would, that I knew what I was talking about. So they said, go out in the real world. I ended up being a banker. Uh, here it says, a banker is a fellow who lends you his umbrella when the sun is shining, but wants it back when it begins to rain. That's true. Uh, the bank I was at um, became the largest bank failure in US history after I left it. But we were told it's a safe banking system, a sound banking system. Our regulators are on top of it. This is a very manageable situation. It meant that I lost all my money and so did 30,000 other employees. But the owners didn't. Uh, the banking system and governments I've suggested are necessary for each other. You don't have one without the other. It's a fiction to believe that you have markets without uh, some force or a government. And finally, we have Benjamin Disraeli who says, money is power and rare are the heads that can withstand the possession of great power. Being rich changes us. Well, we've all seen the studies now. We know that empathy dec decreases, that facial recognition of people's expressions decreases. All sorts of things change when you become wealthy. And interestingly, even though people say, I just want to have enough money to not worry about it, it's shown that the wealthier you get, the more you worry about losing it. Probably because you understand just how powerful it is and how much misery it can create on others. So, is being rich bad? I like what Nicholas uh, Tesla said. He said, this new world should be the world in which the strong won't exploit the weak, the bad won't exploit the good, where the poor won't be humiliated by the rich. It will be the world in which the children of intellect, science, and skills will serve to the community in order to make lives easier and nicer, and not to the individuals for gaining wealth. This new world can't be the world of the humiliated, the broken, but the world of free people and nations, equal in dignity and respect for man. So I hope to never be rich again. The way I say that is because if I had a billion dollars or if I had millions again, what sort of person would I be if I didn't do, use that money to give and help all the poor and the suffering and the children of the world? And I think that answers the question for me. Thank you.